Hi, John Stone here again to talk to you about automating with Z-Wave, the home basics. So for those of you that are new to home automation, I wanted to give a very brief summary of the history, if you will, of home automation. This is not meant to be exhaustive, and since this is home basics, uh, what I'm gonna be sharing is very basic. Uh, I may leave some things out that are more advanced um, than some people may feel they're relevant, um, but a lot of this information is readily available on the internet. All you really have to do is, is do some searching um, and it's easy enough to find um, so that you can get through to the basic. Hope you enjoy it. I'll try not to bore you to tears because this can be some pretty dry stuff. So many people incorrectly believe that affordable home automation is a very new phenomenon. Um, in fact, many of you probably believe that home automation is an expensive proposition. Um, well, both of those are false. Uh, you can get into home automation in a very affordable way, uh, and it actually has been very affordable for over 40 years, or just roughly right at about 40 years. Um, so in this episode, uh, we're gonna look at the brief history of affordable home automation. The history is, uh, in about 1974, there was this group of really smart guys who figured out how to create this UHF remote control uh, for a record player. Now, these guys were so turned on by, by the idea of just being able to control uh, a record player and then a stereo, you know, through this remote control that didn't have any wires on it, that they wanted to try and figure out a way that they could do this with the rest of your house. Um, cool prospect, right? Um, so the same group of engineers actually created this home automation protocol um, simply put, a protocol, if you don't know, is just a language that devices use to talk to each other. Um, and they called this protocol X10. Um, now, these guys were clever. X10 because it was the 10th project that they worked on. So in about 1978, um, their dreams were realized and they were able to get the, the technology out to Sears and to Radio Shack. Um, but it all started back in 1978. The first things they offered were this plug-in remote control switch. Uh, it had these little rocker switches on it that you could just say turn on, turn off. Uh, and then it had a module that you just plugged right into the wall. Uh, and then that you could plug in like a lamp, plug the lamp into it and you'd push the button on the little remote control. Uh, that was plugged into your wall. It traveled through the wires and it hit this little module and it would just turn the light on. Cool stuff. Now, it was wireless-ish. You didn't have to run any new wires. You just kind of plugged everything in and it worked. So it was wireless even though it was still through the wires, but pretty darn clever if you ask me. These are guys that were thinking. Um, so what you see is you have a single device that plugs into the wall and you can have as many modules if you want, kinda. Uh, the early units only controlled about eight modules at a time. And then you had to flip a little switch and then you had your B channel and you could control eight more on the B channel. Um, but you could get, I think, eight or 16 channels and eight or 16 devices uh, on each channel. So you had, uh, I think it's 256 total that you can control, but it was kind of wonky. Um, but again, very simple, but very effective. Um, and as I said, you know, I had one of the first units. I purchased my first unit back in 1986 and was controlling a light and a TV set. I had one of those old TVs. You had to pull it to turn it on, turn the volume up, turn it off all the way on the other side of the room, it was in my bedroom. <sighs> I was lazy, just I'm gonna turn the button and turn it off, right? Um, so anyway, that was my introduction to home automation and over the years I just kept stacking in more Radio Shack and X10 devices, got into the alarms and everything else. Um, but from the beginning, from that point in 1978, um, the types of units that were available quickly expanded into different kinds of switches, uh, remote controls, really wireless remote controls, uh, where you had a module you plugged in, had a big antenna on it, um, and that would then feed everything in from a wireless remote so you could start to walk around your house now with remote control and you, didn't, you weren't constrained by the plug-in. Um, they made an alarm clock, and the alarm clock you could actually set a schedule, and one of the alarm types was turn on that light at 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, so lots of different things. Then they were bringing it into the wall switches so you could turn lights on and off manually as well as um, through the remote control, but it could be the wall switches now and you didn't have to have the plugins. So all in all, X10 is a highly reliable form of inexpensive home automation, um, but it also does have a few limitations and we'll just talk about those real quick. Um, one of the things is that 
household power lines are susceptible to static or noise on the lines and this noise can interfere with the signals so they're you know sometimes you send that signal say hey turn on um, and it just doesn't get there uh, which leads into kind of the next problem with the X10 is uh, the inexpensive forms of X10 only have one-way transmission uh, by that I mean it can only give it the signal say hey turn on and there's nothing there that monitors it. There's no signal back that says, yes, I turned on. So there's no reminder that, you know, like we were talking about where the mother talks to the baby and says, hey, turn on, and it turns on. Um, so, you know, if the signal doesn't make it to the unit, the controller has no way to know. Um, there's also a limitation in the types of units that you can control through X10. Um, everything, uh, basically uh, without getting too expensive has to plug into the outlets um, there are some exceptions you have converters but it, it turns into a very expensive proposition um, to control these other devices um, so if it can't plug in you know basically you can't control it um, so the other lastly is um, circuits or modules that are too far away um, can start to have problems the signal gets weak as it travels over the wires um, gets more susceptible to the noise and you know all the splices and the wire nuts and everything in the walls uh, So it does get kind of you know similar get lost and so it gets reliable the further away uh, that it gets um, So with that uh, we will wrap up X10, but you know again very reliable very affordable uh, But definitely has some limitations and that's really what birthed the need for something like a, a z-wave technology um, so what is Z-Wave? So Z-Wave is a wireless technology that communicates uh, directly with the device uh, through the wireless protocol, again, the, wire, the language that it talks. Um, it also uses something pretty cool called a mesh network. Um, so what a mesh network does is it connects these devices together through the devices so even if the controller can't talk directly to the other control or to the device, um, a device can pass that signal along. So everybody's out there talking and somebody else is helping monitor. So mom gives instruction to the kid to turn off the light. The kid didn't hear it. Uh, the brother or the sister is going to run over and say, hey, mom told you to turn off the light. Um, and then the other thing about the Z-Wave uh, language is it has this response back. Um, it can also integrate into your Wi-Fi so you can start to extend this ability out there because you can get out into the cloud. Who the hell knows what the cloud is anyway? But you can get out there to the cloud and you can do all sorts of other cool things and, and one of the most notable devices that hooks into a Z-Wave network is the Amazon Echo. Um, now the Amazon Echo, that's a whole nother topic. Uh, that we'll be talking about um, a little bit later, but um, it starts to bring in voice control and a whole bunch of other things So you can start to integrate different applications and different cloud services into your home automation network And it, it truly turns into a very powerful and frankly for a guy that's been geeking out on this for 30 years um, Something very exciting the devices that are available today through the mesh network um, a controller can connect into things like light bulbs and thermostats and water sensors and water valves. Uh, so for example, you can put a Z-Wave water sensor in your laundry room or in your water heater room, um, and you can put a Z-Wave valve on your, your main inlet valve. So if it senses the water, it can automatically send a signal over to uh, the valve and turn it off. So if you're on vacation or you're away, you can, you can do all these things that basically are gonna just uh, keep your home safe while you're out and about. To wrap up, in essence, um, Z-Wave is simply a language. Uh, it's not scary. Uh, it allows the devices to communicate with one another. Uh, I know this was a little bit longer episode, but thanks for bearing with me. I hope it was helpful. Uh, please click, click like and uh, feel free to ask me any questions that you want and I'll do my best to answer them. And again, uh, this is basics. Um, now you can just go out the internet and do your big searches and get all geeked out and get all excited like I clearly am about Z-Wave automation. Uh, so have a great day and good luck uh, building your robot house. Take care.